Welcome back to the JDG, everyone. Uh, this is our first meeting for the Trinity term. It's an honor and a pleasure to be joined today by Stephen Darwell. Uh, although he needs no introduction, Stephen Darwell is the Andrew Downey Oric Professor in Philosophy at the Yale University and the John Dewey Distinguished University Professor Emeritus uh, in Philosophy at the University of Michigan. He's well known for his work on practical normativity and the foundations of ethics and is here today to explain to us why obligation can be relational all the way down. Steve, thank you very much for accepting our invitation. The floor is yours. Thank you, Andreas. Um, can everybody hear me? Yes, yes. Yeah, okay, I'm gonna, let's see here. Okay, good. Um, so I'm just going to start with some remarks about uh, some earlier work I've done to try to situate what's going on in this paper in relation to that. And so, of course, the title is Why Obligation Can't Be Relational or Bipolar, pick your term. Uh, you could also say directed obligations. People use that term all the way down. Um, so in the past, I've argued that all of the deontic moral concepts, the concept of duty, concept of obligation, right, wrong, rights, wronging, therefore relational or bipolar obligation, and so on, are all second personal. And what I mean by that is first, they all have a conceptual connection to accountability. Uh, that's part of the concept of a right, for example, that is something you have the right to or claim right anyway. It's the right something you have the authority or standing to claim from someone. Uh, so you all have a conceptual connection to accountability. And we learned from Strassen and the voluminous literature since Strassen that accountability is always implicitly second personal. And what I mean by second personal is not that there has to be a literal other person. Uh, guilt is a second personal attitude in my terms because it involves implicit address. It involves an implied you. So the Strassen thought is, uh, as Adam Braided, I think probably best by Gary Watson in the idea of constraints of moral address, that whenever we have a Strassonian reactive attitude, at least the juridical ones or the deontic ones, um, we are implicitly addressing an expectation or a demand to the person who is the object of the attitude. And then I throw in uh, where it comes with an implicit RSVP. So it's not just uh, take it, but take it and acknowledge it uh, and hold yourself responsible, hold yourself accountable. Okay, so there's, I've argued a conceptual distinction between the idea of there being moral reasons, good moral reasons, or even conclusive, morally conclusive reasons to do something and some things being uh, obligatory. So there are two senses of the moral ought. There's the, that's what I'll call the fully deontic sense. And then there's the moral reasons sense. And we use ought, I think, in, in both ways. So it's just important to be clear about what idea we have in mind. Uh, what makes moral obligation period, as I'll call it, in contrast with um, relational obligation, what makes it second personal is the following conceptual truth. That necessarily S is morally obligated period to do A in C if and only if A is an act of a kind that it would be blameworthy, that's the key notion, blameworthy or culpable, for S to omit in C without excuse. You have to add in without excuse. Uh, and you know, so blameworthiness or culpability can be defeated by two kinds of things. It can be defeated by excuses, which leaves the obligation in place and can be defeated by justifications, which defeats also the obligation. Um, 
So in bipolar obligation, an earlier paper, I argued that the conceptual distinction between obligation period and relational obligation consists in the following, uh, and then also what will be on the screen directly after this. First, most obviously, with obligation period, there's just an obligor, the person who's obligated. But with relational obligation, there's always not just the obligor, but the obligee, the person to whom the obligor is obligated. Likewise, there's a conceptual distinction along the same lines between when you violate moral obligation period, you do wrong. When you violate a relational obligation, you wrong the other person. Uh, Michael Thompson has this, I think, quite um, illuminating notion of bipolar normativity, which characterizes relational obligation. The thought is that there are sort of two poles to the relation and the normative stuff can run back and forth. <laughs> Uh, between them. Whereas in unipolar, in unipolar normativity of obligation period, it's just the obligor who's obligated to do something. And then most people, I think, though, obviously this can be questioned, and there's some interesting counterexamples that could be given, that bipolar normativity uh, typically is thought to entail correlative claim rights. So that if S is obligated to T to do A and C, uh, sorry, that's true if and only if T has a claim right against S to S is doing A and C. Okay, so my analysis of the conceptual difference between obligation period and relational obligation in terms of accountability, the sort of the second personal aspect of each of these is that obligation period entails what I call representative persons or the moral community's representative authority, that is, as a representative, to hold obligors accountable, for example, through the attitude of blame as one mutually accountable person among others. Whereas with relational obligation, that entails that obligees have an individual authority, not as a representative of the moral community, but as the very individual to whom the obligor is obligated, to hold obligors personally accountable through resentment, objection, complaint, release, forgiveness, and so on as, the, as that individual, as a specific individual. So I noticed uh, on the web that C Cecile is doing work on consent and legal justification. That's right on this distinction, right? So the question is, generally we think of criminal law as being uh, not a matter of the distinctive authority of a victim, but of the community or the prosecutor speaking for the people. Uh, whereas with torts, we think that, well, it's up to the individual whether or not to bring a tort case. And so if I consent to a somebody doing a crime against me, arguably I have no tort case because I have waived, uh, I've consented uh, any individual authority I had, but that's whether the community has an authority to hold that person accountable for the crime seems still to be in place. So that's that's the distinction. Okay, so for purposes of this paper, I'm just going to be assuming. So, so what, what we're trying to prove here is that even if all pro tanto obligations were relational, nonetheless, we'd still need the concept of moral obligation period. We can't do without that concept. So I'm just going to be assuming that all pro tanto obligations are relational, that there are no ungrounded moral obligations, period. So I'll assume, for example, that there's no obligation, for example, not to um, destroy beauty, whether natural beauty, well, let's just take that case. Um, where that's not owed to anyone in particular, but just uh, an obligation period. So let's, let's just assume that all moral obligations, all pro tanto ones are relational. Even so, I'll be arguing we need the concept of moral obligation period. And one way to see that actually right off the bat is that the very distinction between pro tanto 
obligation and all things considered obligation is not itself a bipolar relation. Whether I'm all things considered obligated to do something is not a matter itself that's owed to any particular obligee. Similarly, something's being, a, it just follows then that being a pro tanto obligation also, uh, that, that concept is, is employing the concept of moral obligation, period. But I'll try to make it more interesting uh, and argue that we need the idea of moral obligation, period, both from the deliberative perspective, when we're trying to figure out what we have most reason to do, both most moral reason and just most reason, period, and that we need the idea from the perspective we occupy when we hold one another accountable as equal moral persons. And the central idea of the argument is that only the notion of moral obligation period and not the notion of bipolar obligation is tied conceptually to culpability. So go back again to that slide earlier where I said it's a conceptual truth that if an action is morally obligatory, then it's an action of a kind such that um, it would be blameworthy to perform it were one to do it without excuse. There's no such conceptual connection between relational obligation and culpability. And so I'm be arguing then that we can't do without the idea of culpability. Now, I'm not saying that any rational agent has to have the idea of culpability. I just mean from within the perspective of morality, from within the perspective of deontic moral concepts, we can't give up the idea of moral obligation, period. Why? Well, partly because from the deliberative perspective, when we're trying to figure out what we have most reason to do, um, and suppose we think that if we're obligated morally to do something, all things considered, then we couldn't have sufficient reason not to do it. Well, that thought itself, I'll be arguing, is driven by the nature of blame and its presuppositions. Um, and so we'll need the notion of blames, but not just blame pure and simple, but something warranting blame, that is being culpable. Similarly, like, similarly uh, from the perspective we occupy when we hold one another mutually accountable, um, we can't do simply with the notion of relational obligation. Suppose I know that you've violated a relational obligation to me, um, or that I know you've done it, divided, violated such an obligation to someone else, make it not personal. Um, I can't yet draw any conclusions about whether you are uh, to be held accountable, all things considered. Uh, it may be that you had a weightier obligation to do something else. Okay. Or maybe there's some other consideration, as we'll see in these cases that Francis Cam draws our attention to, where you had weightier reason, weightier moral reason to do something else, which didn't derive from a bipolar obli obligation. Okay. Why is that? Well, I've argued in a number of places, uh, perhaps most specifically uh, in making the hard problem of moral normativity easier, which is in a volume uh, titled Weighing Reasons, uh, that it's just a presupposition of blame that the blamed agent didn't have reason to do what they're being blamed for doing. That is, they didn't have sufficient reason for doing it. This is not an idea I cooked up. I mean, even Bernard Williams has this idea. A number of other philosophers, Gifford, and a number of others, uh, Russ Schaefer Landau and so on, have, have argued it also. Why is that? Well, if I'm blaming you, then I'm holding implicitly then that you, I'm holding you accountable. So I'm saying, okay, justify yourself. Show me that you had reason to do the thing in question. If the person can't do that, that is if, they, if, if it's what they did actually was culpable, then it, it, that just means then that there wasn't sufficient justification what is, um, or entails there wasn't sufficient, sufficient justification for them to have acted. But since an act is obligatory period, if and only if it's an act of a kind that it would be culpable to perform without excuse, 
it just follows that an act is obligatory period only if there is conclusive reason to do it. It doesn't go back the other direction. It's not if and only if, because you can have conclusive reason to do things that are not obligatory, uh, all things considered. But if you are morally obligated to do something, all things considered, then it follows that what that action would be uh, failing to do it would be blameworthy without excuse. And if it's blameworthy, then that means that would justify blame. And blame is always presupposing that you don't have sufficient reason to do what you're being blamed for doing. Okay. So I want to consider first three different kinds of deliberative questions. And what's what we're trying to determine here is which of these, if any, uh, can I raise for myself and in principle answer even if I lack the idea of moral obligation period. If all I have is the idea of relational or bipolar obligation. First is just the question of what I what do I have most reason to do? Uh, sort of the basic question of the deliberative standpoint. Second, uh, the question that a moral agent faces insofar as they're trying to act in the way they would be would be morally best. What's the most morally choice worthy act? Um, uh, and that's the question, what do I have most moral reason to do? And then finally, what am I morally obligated, period, uh, to do all things considered? Now, of course, by definition, that's not a question that the person who lacks the idea of moral obligation period can raise. Uh, but I, I'll be arguing that that's an important question for us from the deliberative perspective. Okay, so just suppose I make a promise to A and a promise to B. And suppose uh, I can't keep both. Sort of standard philosopher's kind of case. Which deliberative questions can I ask and answer without the concept of moral obligation period? Well, it seems as if there's just no problem at all raising the question of which relational obligation I have weightier reason uh, to discharge. I don't have to have the, the notion of moral obligation period to raise that question. Uh, the notion of reason for acting, of course, is not itself bipolar, but that doesn't matter for the point in question. So suppose I determine that I have weightier reason to uh, discharge my obligation to be, to keep my promise to be. Well, note that that can't itself answer what I have most reason to do, all things considered. Right, I me mean, most obviously, uh, I might have some other, even relational obligation that trumps my obligation to A and to B. Or there might be some other kind of consideration as in a case that we'll be considering in a moment that Francis Cam has proposed, where even though I don't have some other obligation that outweighs uh, as an obligation, nonetheless um, uh, is, a, is a weightier moral reason. Or maybe there are other reasons like prudential reasons for me to not discharge either. Reasons that would be outweighed if I was morally obligated, all things considered, to do one or the other, but they're not necessarily outweighed if these are just both relational obligations. There's nothing in the concept of relational obligation that requires that you have to have a justification uh, to avoid culpability, because the idea of culpability doesn't even come into it. Okay. Um, so, the question of what do I have most reason to do, I can get somewhere with uh, just using the concept of relational obligation with that question, but I can't determine, I can't bring deliberation to a close. No reason to think uh, that's something that someone who wants to think there are relational obligations thinks should be true. Uh, this is not an argument against relational obligation. I'm a great fan of relational obligations. It's just that 
that by itself isn't sufficient to map the moral terrain. Okay. So what about the question, what do I have most moral reason to do? So we'll put off the table cases where there are reasons of other kinds that might trump as normative reasons, the reasons that the relational obligations give me. Let's just reason from within the moral point of view. And so as a moral agent trying to do the morally best thing, what there's most moral reason to do, I ask, uh, what sh should I do? Should I keep my promise to A? Should I keep my promise to B? Well, so far as that exhausts the alternatives, there, it seems as if there's no problem. I could just hold that my uh, obligation to A gives me a weightier moral reason than my obligation to B. The problem is that even if that were true, there could be yet other alternatives that I have more moral reason to do, uh, which don't involve keeping my obligation to A or to B or indeed to anyone else. That's the crucial problem. Okay, so the case that Francis Cam proposes puts together two quite familiar kinds of case. One we know from Ross on prima facie duties. I make a promise to someone, uh, say to meet them for lunch, but on the way to, um, to meet them, I run across an auto accident, let's say, and I can very easily uh, summon help, but summoning help will require me to miss, um, miss lunch, hence not keep my promise. Okay, so th th that's a kind of case we're all familiar with. To that, Cam adds in, well, it's not so easy. <laughs> Actually, I don't just have to summon help. This person needs the donation of a kidney, and you'll, of course, recognize Judith Thompson's famous case. So the CAM case, you get the CAM case by putting together the Ross case and the Thompson case. And what CAM says about the, the case she's proposing is, uh, well, following Thompson, even though it would be morally very good for me to donate my kidney, I'm not required to do so. And I certainly don't owe it to the person who needs the kidney. And there's no other person that I owe it to either. Nonetheless, it would be morally better for me to give up my kidney uh, and miss you know, my lunch date uh, and hence uh, uh, not keep my promise than it would be for me to keep my promise, obviously, and refuse uh, to give my kidney. So in this kind of case, even if it's true that my promise to A outweighs my promise to B uh, morally, and so we can determine that I have weightier moral reason to do one rather than the other, that won't show that I have, that's what I have most moral reason to do, all moral reasons considered, uh, even all relational obligations considered. Okay, so that's the problem. Um, so in a CAM case, the moral reason for acting owing to my protanto obligation period to keep my promise is morally outweighed though not by a weightier obligation. And that reason justifies my not keeping the promise, thereby defeating the obligation. So you might think, oh, this is a problem that's sort of peeking up over the horizon that also afflicts someone who wants to use the notion of moral obligation, period. Because aren't I still morally obligated to keep one promise or the other? And the answer is no, I'm not because that what would otherwise be obligatory gets defeated as a justification uh, by this other very weighty moral reason, even though it doesn't come from another obligation. So it remains the case that were I morally obligated, all things considered to keep the promise, as I'm not, uh, 
then that would have been the mo what there was both what I have most moral reason to do and uh, what I have most reason, all things considered, to do. So we can think through the problem very nicely with the concept of moral obligation period in a way that we can't if we just have the notion of relational obligation. And the point there, of course, is that blameworthiness claims are defeated both by excuses, which keep the obligation in place, and by justifications, which do not. Justifications defeat claims of all things considered obligation. So both A's and B's underlying claims remain, and they continue to ground relational obligations to each, which continue to be pro tanto obligations, ones that are defeated, I argue. Um, but the thought is that if all you've got is the notion of relational obligation, you can't, you can't solve that problem. OK, so the moral is that we need the idea of moral obligation period, both from the deliberative perspective and from the perspective we occupy when we hold one another mutually accountable as equal moral persons. And thank you very much. Yeah, so yeah. Thank you very much, Steve. I'm sure uh, everyone will join me. Thank you for this very elucidating presentation. Uh, we'll now have a two minute break and then we'll get back for the Q&A section. <laughs>